I want to talk about um, the use of alternative ingredients. Uh, I'm sure that uh, most, if not all of you, have uh, morphed away from corn soy diets and are using distillers grains or other ingredients. And I want to chat a little bit about some of the challenges associated with that, but maybe not try to deal with some of the ones that are not so immediately obvious when we make those kinds of transitions. Um, I would like to invite you as I go through my presentation, if you have any questions to just feel free to ask me as I'm going along. Um, it helps me to know what kind of questions are going through your mind and if we have time at the end I'll certainly answer questions at the end and if you want to talk to me one on one um, we can talk after the session as well. So anything I can do to help out please, uh, please let me know. One of the things that happens when we make a dramatic change as we've done when we've changed the nature of our diets that we use in the pig industry is that there's the things that are obvious to us and then there's the things that are not so obvious. Kind of like an iceberg, you see what's above the surface of the water but you don't know what's under the surface of the water. This is, uh, this is a slide or a picture that I got off the internet. I uh, kind of like it. it uh, it's a fairly simple picture. It looks like a guy driving this uh, half ton and three quarter ton kind of lost her, jumped over the median here, fortunately missed the culvert, and uh, did a 180 and landed where he did. Looks like a hopefully relatively innocuous accident as we look at that picture. But if we look at the total picture, we see something quite different because that's what it looks like, and there's the truck right there. And so uh, the situation could have been a whole lot worse if he'd had landed just uh, 10 feet over to his right. So. We need to know the whole story. We need to know everything about what's going on, and that's what I'd like to talk to you about ingredients today. By the way, when you get something off the net, you have no idea whether that's been, uh, um, what's the word, uh, uh, Adobe print shopped. And, but it makes for a good story, if nothing else, because it fit what I wanted to say. So what are some of these not so obvious challenges of using these ingredients? One is the, the cost of energy that I want to talk about and the concentration of energy. I want to talk about the impact of ingredients on carcass and pork quality. And I'm going to really mention that just very briefly because our next speaker, Dr. Proust, is going to get into that in a lot, lot more detail. Plus, he knows a lot more about it. Um, thirdly, I want to talk about the variability of nutrient concentration in these ingredients and what the implications are for us. I want to talk about some of the differences in physical characteristics, not just the nutritional characteristics of these ingredients. And then if I have time, we'll talk about some of the other things, but there's the four key ones that I want to focus on. So you've got the story now, so if, you, if that's not what you came to hear about, you can get up and leave now because that's what I'm going to talk about for the next half hour, 40 minutes. Well, what's the issue? The issue is, is that I did the pricing just two days ago using hope current prices around Ames that um, uh, as of Monday, the difference between feeding a corn soy diet and a diet that contains a multitude of ingredients, recognized ingredients that would maintain performance, is at least $15 a ton, which then is at least $5 a pig sold, if we're including fair to finish. These are huge dollars. And in certain markets, that can be the difference between losing money and making money. It can be as much as $25 a ton if we're aggressive in the use of these alternative ingredients. So we're talking about a lot of dollars. We talk about feed conversion as well, and just to look at the cost of feed a little bit differently, I really like this graph, and it shows the cost, the average cost of feed in a wean-to-finish operation, and then the value of one point of feed conversion, i.e. from 2.8 to 2.81. What is the value of that? Well, if you're starting off with a wean-to-finish feed conversion of 2.63, um, uh, an increase in one point of feed conversion is worth 30 cents per pig. So if you go from 2.8 to 2.81, that just costs 31 cents. If you go from 2.8 to 2.85, that just costs $1.50 a pig. So we have to pay attention to the efficiency with which we use these diets. If we're starting at a feed conversion of 293, which is pretty high for a wean to finish operation, that's 32 cents per pig. Um, and so that is a lot of money and we have to pay attention to that. A couple of, couple of very basic things. We have over probably the last four decades or five decades, we fed corn soy. That's what we became familiar with. That was what we were comfortable with. 
But fundamentally, the pig does not need corn or soybean meal in the diet in order to uh, be fed successfully and profitably to market. Um, I had a pork producer where I was before in Saskatchewan, a um, guy that kept immaculate records and was always focusing on his profitability. And he were, at that time, and this would be back in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, where most people up there would be feeding wheat, barley, soybean meals or diet, he was feeding wheat, barley, field peas, and canola. And he was netting $5 a pig. There was no soybean meal in those diets at all. He maintained his performance because the diets were balanced properly, and carcass was not impaired at all, but he netted $5 a pig. So we want to keep in mind we're comfortable with corn and soy, but that doesn't mean the pig needs corn and soy. And indeed, I see commercial diets now with only 20 to 25% corn in them. So the world has, has really changed. Just as, as an example, here's some diets from Western Canada, say a grower diet, wheat, barley, uh, distiller's grains, field peas, canola meal, no, no soybean meal in those diets at all. And producer feeding those diets would be getting feed growth rates of around the 175, 185. And feed conversions would be higher because that's a lower energy diet. The feed conversion feeder to finish would be in the range of 285 to 29. Okay. Um, but just to show what's going on in another part of the world, this are European diets. Theirs are even more complex. I'm glad I'm not a nutritionist in Europe because they have to really earn their money. Because if you look uh, a grower diet, wheat, barley, corn, wheat middlings, wheat feeds, soybean meal, canola meal, sunflower meal, and a fat source. That is hugely different from what we are familiar with, and yet that's what they have to feed in order to maintain profitability in Europe. Sir? Good question? Yes. I think, good question, and I'm glad you brought it up. That's why I like questions in the middle of a presentation. Um, I think what you're referring to is is in Europe, they feed their pigs to much lighter weights than they do, and could you feed those diets successfully, that kind of a diet successfully, up to 275 or 300 pounds? And the answer is yes, you can. But good question, very good question. So fundamentally, when we want to put together a feeding program for pigs, we really want to look at two things. We want to look first off, what nutrients do we need to give to these pigs in terms of energy, amino acids, vitamins, and minerals? We define that based on the genetics of our pig and what we want our pigs to accomplish. And then we say, well, that's the nutrients we need. Where are we going to get those nutrients? Well, I have access to corn, to bean meal, to I can get wheat mids, I can get bakery product, I can get distiller's grains, um, I can get synthetic amino acids. How am I going to meet those requirements? I put them together into the feeding program, all keeping in mind what my objectives for my farm are. And you'll notice that these arrows go in the, both directions so that when I'm focusing on a feeding program to maximize net income, I can come back up here, I can change the nutrient requirements. Because maybe I can make more money, depending on the system that I'm working in, maybe I can make money by feeding a less expensive diet and my pigs go to market slower, but overall I make more money. But maybe I'm in a system where pigs are coming out of the Fairwind barn or they're coming from the feeder pig supplier, and i got to get those pigs out in 16 weeks or 17 weeks or whatever the number is. I cannot afford to have those pigs slow down. Well, then that, that plays into what are, are the requirements that I'm focusing on. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on as well. So pigs don't have requirements for ingredients, but rather for energy and nutrients. Second is the objective that I'm always focusing on in presentations would be cost of production and net income, not performance. Now we pay attention to performance because performance is one of the things that contributes to profitability, but I learned a long time ago and it was painful um, because um, I found out that I had been talking about performance for so long and then I talk to some individual producers and they say, John, come here, I want to show you some numbers. And within their organization, they had farms where the performance was slightly poorer, but their profitability was substantially higher. So performance, maximizing performance, does not necessarily maximize profitability. So I like as much as possible to be focusing on product profitability 
but of course we have to keep in mind the performance in terms of barn throughput and those kinds of things. But if I lose five points of feed conversion, but I make my, my feed less expensive and therefore save money, I'm happy to do that. As long as I get the pigs out the barn when I need to, and as long as I'm maximizing my net income. Okay, so not so obvious issue number one deals with energy. Energy is by far the most costly component of the diet. And yet, when we were in corn soy think, um, we really didn't think very much about what is the cost of energy. Because it was, compared to anywhere else in the world, it was certainly inexpensive. But um, um, are we, we now have to ask the question, because energy is more expensive, are we using the energy in the diet as effectively as possible? If we grind, if we reduce particle size, that will improve the efficiency with which the pig uses the energy in that diet. And I'm seeing particle size now down to 300, 350 microns. Now those are in pelleted diets because it's hard to get a 350 micron diet to flow in most systems that you would have on the farm. But that's the extent that people will go to in order to maximize the energy that they can extract from that uh, ingredient. And please keep in mind that byproduct ingredients tend to have a lower energy concentration than corn soy. And we're going to talk about that. So as we move to byproduct ingredients, we have to do one of two things. We either have to accept that the energy level in our diets went down, or we have to make other manipulations in the diet, such as adding more fat, in order to maintain the energy, because many byproducts will lower the energy concentration of the diet. So let's take a look here. I did a formulation. This would be last November. And what I did was I started out and I formulated first just for energy. So I used the computer formulation package. I put in the energy spec and nothing else. And the cost of that diet, and here's the ingredient cost that I used at the time, the cost came to $210 a ton. Then I continued to formulate that diet by adding in the amino acid requirements. Okay. And that brought the cost of the diet up to $230 a ton. So I added, it cost about 20 bucks to meet the amino acid specifications. And then I brought in all the specs for vitamins and minerals, and the total cost of the diet then was $245 a ton, $244 a ton. So what this means is, is that just meeting the energy spec represented 86% of the cost of that diet. We need to pay attention to energy because that is a lot of money. Now, of course, this isn't the cost of energy per se, because when I bring in energy through corn and distillers and so on, there's amino acids present and there's some minerals present and so on, but just meeting that spec for, for energy is 86% of the total. Let's take a look at how this has changed and how ingredients uh, relate to each other. When corn was 250 a bushel, uh, one megacalorie, we measure energy in kilocalories or megacal, one megacal of ME cost 2.9 cents. Corn at two, $220 a ton, so that's just, what, 650 a bushel or something in that range, is now 7.1 cents. So it's two and a half times as expensive. And we need, again, we need to keep that in mind when we're formulating diets. Now, why do we use byproduct ingredients? Well, because DDGs at $190 a ton, ME costs 6.3 cents per megacal compared to corn at 7.1. And bakery byproducts 6.8 cents. So we're saving money when we use those, uh, those ingredients. But take a look at the energy content of those ingredients. DDGs, depending on the source, they're varying widely, um, and more recently even more so. Energy's down a little bit compared to corn. Middlings is a lot lower than corn. Byproducts, depending on the, on the bakery byproduct, can be higher than corn in energy content. And then, how does the pig use uh, energy? So if we want to make sure that the pig is using energy most effectively and most efficiently, it helps us to understand where does the energy go that the pig eats and the pig absorbs. Amazingly, about a third of the energy that the pig consumes goes to maintenance. Now, in my case, when I eat, I'd like 100% of the energy I eat to go to maintenance, but unfortunately it hasn't. 
okay, we can still grow after we reach mature body weight. But in the growing pig, a third of the energy that pig consumes is used for maintenance. Maintenance refers to the energy that's used to pump blood, make the lungs work, make the muscles work so that we can move. Um, but it can also, in this analysis, it would include fighting off disease, um, fighting off other pigs, dealing with temperature problems, etc. So anything that's not related to growth would be put into maintenance. Protein gain is only 20% of the energy consumed by the pig. And then fat gain almost half. And this is a pig that's growing quite well. This pig is um, between 100 and 200 pounds, is growing 1.9 pounds a day. That's pretty dang good growth rate. It's not rock star, but it's, it's pretty dang good. And is uh, and a feed conversion of 2.58. So this is not a an over fat pig. But even then, 46% of the energy that pig consumes is going to lay down fat. But if we, we can go to a low energy diet, and if we formulate the diet correctly for energy, we can maintain performance. And one of my students who's here this morning, I'm colorblind Nestor, but I think that's orange sweater you're wearing, something like that. Um, this is Nestor's work, and he fed corn bran and he fed it at 8, 16, and 24% of the diet, in a diet that was otherwise corn soy. And when he just replaced the corn with the bran, that's the green bars, um, feed conversion got worse because corn bran has less energy than corn. So as you take out corn and put in bran, energy goes down, feed conversion got worse. But when Nestor formulated his diets to maintain energy, i.e. by adding fat to the diet so that all of these diets that are in red um, have the same energy level, then feed conversion was maintained constant. So as long as we pay attention, we can maintain a constant feed conversion by feeding lower energy ingredients, if that's the most economical thing for us to do. This is a, another uh, study done years, uh, years ago with, with um, uh, wheat different wheat sources, illustrating that pigs think differently than people. And in this particular trial, we ran this study because pork producers believe that pigs would perform best on what's called hard red spring wheat. Okay, they um, And they paid a premium for that when they were buying wheat. If they had to buy utility wheats, they would pay less. If they had to use durum wheat, they'd pay even less again because the impression was is that pigs would perform more poorly on these utility wheats. Well, when we asked the pig the question, after the first week, there was absolutely no different. The pigs grew just as fast and just as efficiently on these different wheats. So producers then went out and said, well, I can get the same performance on utility wheats rather than hard red spring. I'm going to switch over to utility wheats. So feeding what the pig wants and will perform best on rather than what we sometimes think the pig will perform best on. I want to run you through some scenarios um, to illustrate this, this issue of, of energy. What we did is we formulated diets of four different energy levels, so 1550 megacals of ME, and then we dropped it to 1510, 1470, and 1430. Okay. And so we get lower energy level in the diet, and then we have three scenarios. And what we did is we ran these scenarios. We're working on a pig growth model where we can put into the model the diet and the genetics of the pig and so on. It's, it's a Cargill model called Pork Max, and it'll tell us how the pig performs. So what we did is this is how the pigs would perform on this higher energy diet and what happens when we lower the energy. Three scenarios. In the first scenario, which I call constant feed intake and weight, meaning that the pigs could not eat more feed in response to the lower energy level of the diet. Oftentimes, pigs will eat to their energy requirement. So if you feed them a lower energy diet, they will eat more feed in order to maintain the same daily energy intake. But in a lot of our commercial circumstances, pigs cannot do that. So you feed a lower energy diet, the pigs eat the same amount, their daily energy intake goes down 
And that's what this row is all about. So you can see that as energy went down, growth rate went down. But we fed to the same weight, so these pigs had to be in the barn a lot longer to get the market, but they all went to the same final weight of 285. The next row is constant feed intake, but we just left them in the barn the same number of days. We said, we've pigs got to go in 16 weeks, they're gone, and so this is their uh, average daily gain. And of course, it's the same or virtually the same as this group. But then this bottom one, which is really interesting, this is the scenario where the pigs are able to increase their intake in response to the lower energy diet. And in some farms this will happen, in some farms it won't. We can talk about that later on, when and when that will or will not happen. So growth rate was maintained because the pigs were able to maintain their daily energy intake. What happens to feed efficiency? Well, at constant feed intake and final end weight, feed efficiency got a lot worse because we're feeding a lower energy diet. It's less digestible, takes more feed to put on a pound of gain, so feed conversion gets worse as we lower the energy. The feed conversion is a little bit better in this group because the pigs stayed in the barn the same number of days, so they were lighter when they went to market, and a lighter pig will have a better feed conversion than a heavier pig. So that's why this row has slightly better feed conversion, but those pigs went, went out the door way too light. Way too light. This group, we got a, we get a poorer feed conversion because of the lower energy, but at the end of the feeding trial, feeding period, they would have the same ending body weight. So let's take a look at feed cost. That's really the bottom line. So we'll say the control group, the feed cost was $85.45. We then, as we lowered the energy, we lower the cost of feed per pig down to this energy level. But if we went lower still, we actually increased our feed cost because the increase in feed conversion was greater than the savings in feed cost. That makes sense? So, so we, there was an optimum here. But remember, these pigs got to be in the barn a lot longer. Feed cost went down here dramatically because we're selling smaller pigs. We shipped the pigs out earlier, so of course our feed costs went down, but our income would tank because we'd be selling much lighter pigs. In this scenario, where the pigs went out at the same weight and they were able to increase their intake, we can save money all the way down, pretty much plateau out here. So from a 1550 diet to a 1470 diet, we're saving almost $4 a pig. So $4 more profit and no loss in income. But that's because the pigs in this barn would be able to increase their feed intake. And that's the critical information that you need to know in your operation is whether the pigs have the ability to increase their intake. So typically, we feed pigs to achieve a, a, a target growth rate because many of our barns and systems are set up. Pigs got to go to market within a certain time frame. But at what point do we say that these lower cost ingredients are coming available to us? We can save money by feeding lower cost ingredients, but they're also lower energy and they're going to slow down growth rate in our pigs. But they're going to be a lot cheaper to feed. And I really do believe that within our the overall structure of our pig industry in the United States, this is a critical question. But in order to feed these lower energy diets where pigs are growing slower, we're going to have to have more grow out space to handle pigs being in the barn longer. And it's all going to come down to which which circumstance maximizes net income. Okay, the not so obvious issue number two is the impact of ingredients on carcass composition. I said I'd mention this very briefly. Uh, another one of my students uh, in the crowd here, and I think that's black, but it could be navy blue. Uh, Trey uh, is a master's student working on iodine value, and what he did is he fed uh, three different fats, tallow, choice white grease, and corn oil. Now, he identified the iodine value, and the iodine value of a fat tells you how unsaturated that fat is, and unsaturation means that the fat will either be liquid at room temperature or solid at room temperature. And the issue is, is that packers are growing uneasy with carcasses where the fat is softer, and it causes problems with 
uh, processing in the plant, and Dr. Proust is going to talk about that. So, But what Trey showed is, is that when he fed tallow to 3 or 6%, the iodine value in the carcass, because we can measure the iodine value in the fat being fed and in the carcass itself, was below 74, and 74 seems to be an evolving target that we're seeing in the industry. When he fed choice white grease that had an iodine value of 67, and choice white grease, the iodine value can vary dramatically, that iodine value for choice white grease could get up to 75 or even 80, and that would be a different, give you different results. But still, um, the iodine value in the carcass was below 74. But when he fed corn oil, which would be the same oil that's in distiller's grains. So when you feed distiller's grains, you're feeding corn oil as well because there's 8 to 10% oil in the distiller's grains. You can see that at the low level, his iodine value was below the, the, the barrier, but his high level was well above at 80. Sir? Ah, okay. So this would be 3% or this, so that'd be 60 pounds. But if we go over here to corn oil, say, at 3%, that would be the same of, as adding about, um, uh, let me see, so there's, let's say there's 10% uh, fat in DDGs, so 3% would be about 30, 30% uh, DDGs. Okay? Okay, so, uh, and we fed straight corn oil rather than DDGs because we can control it, but it's the same fat and has, would have the same digestibility. So that's issue number two very briefly. Issue number three, these ingredients vary in their composition, uh, and the variability can be huge. If we take a look at, uh, at distillers' grains, for example, we can see that the energy level of distillers ranged from 1,590 to 1,830 kilocalories of ME per, per pound. That is, a, that is a huge range. Um, protein from 28.7 to 32.9, that's important, but energy is the more critical factor. The fat level, though, from 8.8 .8 to 12.4, that in part explains this big range in energy. There's a world of difference between distillers grains with 8.5% fat and distillers with 12.5% fat. This would be very much related to the processing itself. Okay, and um, moisture could play a role. As and a good question, because you see there is some variation in the in the moisture content, but the uh, the majority of it is just the composition of the product. So, for example, right now the DDGs that are being sold, um, some will have ten to ten and a half percent fat. That would have been the ori original DDGs that came out, but more and more ethanol plants are removing part of that fat, and so we're now seeing DDGs that are around 8 to 8.5% 8 fat. And we need to know which one we're feeding because the nutrient profile is very different. To show that the variation is, it's a bad thing in that we have to deal with it, but as long as we characterize it and know what it is, we can deal with it. I should come over and talk to this side of the room for a while. How's that? I don't know what to do when I got two, two screens here. Um, but this is a trial of field peas. Believe it or not, this is 11 varieties of field peas, all grown on the same quarter section of land, same 160 acres, and varies in energy by 22%. Incredible. So producer asked us to, to work on this, so we determined the DE content of each sample. We then formulated diets uh, and formulated the diets to have a constant energy level and here's what happened to our um, feed efficiency. Unfortunately, it's the inverse. It's uh, gain over feed rather than feed over gain. But as you can see, we almost were 100% in equalizing feed efficiency. So once we characterized the ingredient and formulated the diet properly, we could maintain almost constant feed efficiency, even though the ingredient varied by 22%. And uh, I, um, we didn't make it quite 100%, right? There's still... a Three, three varieties there that still gave us a poor feed conversion. Yes. Yeah, and gradually over time, what we've seen is the protein level of corn is going down. Yeah, so if you've got an old book and it says corn has 8.5% protein in it, um, you might want to buy a new book, okay, because that's, we see a lot of corn way lower than that. 
So quality control becomes really, really critical, and that's the major change that I believe we have to embrace when we, and I don't see enough of it in the field, quite frankly, as we've gone from corn soy, which is a relatively consistent, predictable environment, to using these uh, byproducts. We have to know exactly what's in our incoming ingredients. We have to get them analyzed, and there's lots of people doing that. I, uh, some of the data sets we see are really, truly impressive. Um, we have to be careful that our feed manufacturing process is keeping up. We have to make sure that the mixed feed that's coming out of the mill contains the nutrient specs that we expect it to have. And then finally, the point that's missing in a lot of quality control programs is, are the pigs performing to the level we want them to? So most quality control programs would cover this part, the incoming ingredients and analyzing the mixed feed, but very few take that information and relate it to the performance of the pigs. Think for a minute, um, Ford Motor Company, who for many years used to be the butt of jokes because of the mechanical problems with their vehicles. And then all of a sudden, Powers, J.D. Powers and Associates came out, I think it was two years ago or three, and said they had the best repair record of any car manufacturer. I couldn't believe it, but read an article in, uh, in a business magazine, and what they did is they focused on the quality of the product measured at the level of the dealer and the service that was required, and took that information, made corrections to the manufacturing, product goes out and back and forth. So they were looking at the final product to make sure that what they were manufacturing met spec. I'm just saying we need to do the same thing in the pig industry. Issue number four is the physical characteristics. And sometimes if you're not familiar, not aware of this, it can come up and bite you on the butt and be rather embarrassing. Um, and that is, is that physical characteristics such as bulk density or flowability. And it's one thing to buy an ingredient and put it in your mill and save a bunch of money, but if it won't flow through the mill, or if it bungs up in the, in the bins or in the feeders, then uh, you've got yourself a world of hurt going on. So for example, if we take a look at the bulk density of a variety of ingredients, and corn um, has a, a density of 37 pounds per cubic foot, distiller's grains can be as low as 31, so we may have had a, a one-ton mixer, but all of a sudden now it's an 1,800-pound mixer because of bulk density. We take a look at the bulk density of soybean meal. It's even higher than corn, but wheat middlings is only about half the density of corn and soybean meal. So if we go from a diet that's corn soy and all of a sudden switch to 20% mids, will it fit into our, our mixer? When you fill the feeders in your barn and you run the, the, the automatic feed line, if you're, only, if you're running it manually and you only run it once a day and you can't get as much feed into that feeder when it's, when it's bulky compared to being dense, there may not be enough feed in that feeder. And a question we're asking right now, we really don't know the answer, but we have another student that's looking at that, and that is, do pigs eat diets that have these alternate ingredients in them as quickly or at the same speed as they ate a corn soy diet. Because if they ate them more slowly, then that has an impact on feeder capacity. Because if pigs are eating slower, then what used to be enough feeder capacity on a corn soy diet may not be enough feeder capacity with one of these new diets. We don't know that's an issue. We have some, one student observed it in, a, in an experiment and or made an observation, and eating speed could be an explanation, so now we have an experiment in a commercial farm where we're actually looking at that. So, in summary then, many alternative ingredients are lower in energy, and their most effective use occurs in a diet if the energy can be lowered, either if our pigs can increase their intake to accommodate that, or if we can accept our pigs growing slower. I want to emphasize we can feed alternative ingredients and maintain equal performance. It's not rocket science. It's not, it's not even difficult. We can do it. So I don't want to leave the impression that feeding alternative ingredients is going to slow down growth because if you formulate the diets correctly, it will not. And there's millions of pigs being fed that way. But we could get even more value out of these ingredients if we would allow the energy level of the diets to go down. Oops. Uh, sorry. Uh, changes in carcass quality and composition 
Uh, we need to keep that in mind, and Dr. Proust is going to talk about that. There's an increased need for quality control, so maybe we're saving $5 a pig um, by using these alternative ingredients. We may be better turn around and spend 50 cents of that $5 on quality control to make sure that we're maintaining the quality of the diet so we can maintain performance in our barn. And then changes in bulk density or other aspects of the ingredient we need to keep in mind and be aware of before we start using the ingredient. It's a lot easier to prepare for than deal with it once it's in the bin.